Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, I have never met Steve Wozniak, <laughs> but I don't care. <laughs> uh, so my title today uh, it probably sounds more original than the talk is actually going to be because I think I'm going to revisit themes that people have touched upon uh, throughout the day and that perhaps the subsequent speakers will also uh, refer to. But I wanted to try and give a uh, uh, an, an academic perspective to this, because as Graham just alluded to, I think this is probably a fairly uh, sort of open data, open access uh, friendly audience. I imagine that's the sort of people that uh, would um, uh, be prepared to pay uh, to attend such event. I wonder how many actually uh, academic researchers uh, would. I think you tend to have to ambush them. So we've had lots of excitement, I think, today uh, in the room. Uh, the Mendeley rep was particularly excited, I was uh, pleased to note. Uh, um, about digital technologies, uh, and so, and, and that's a good thing. You know, it's good that there is a vanguard, <coughs> and that there are people who are really interested in this thing, a sort of nerdy element, as it were, that's prepared to sort of dig into it, figure out, you know, what works, what doesn't work, and then try and sell it to the rest of the community. But I do think uh, we have to do a much better job um, of selling it. This is uh, one of the most enthusiastic photographs I have of my youngest daughter, Charlotte, taken 12 years ago. Um, she's now not quite so excited when she sees me. Uh, so, but, uh, but we're, we're still together. <laughs> but academics perhaps have a slightly different take uh, on the digital world and maybe on open data uh, and open access. And I, you know, I do think we need to uh, make sure that we take that on board. For many of them, of course, they're vaguely aware of it and they're, uh, I think the majority would be uh, broadly sympathetic to the idea of having open access and, well, even open data, although I think that probably uh, in their minds creates more of a headache uh, because obviously there are many different formats and some fields are more data friendly than others in terms of the, uh, the outputs they, that they produce. In my particular field, I'm a structural biologist and we do generate large amounts of diffraction data and we generate electronic files of atomic coordinates and there's been a long-standing database that's uh, internationally recognized and very widely used. But for all the other stuff that we do, uh, my group is still using uh, paper and cardboard laboratory notebooks and writing in with ink pen and uh, uh, you know, when we are then tasked with sharing that data, that's really going to be a big headache. So, so we've got to think about you know, putting ourselves or making that journey to where the academics are uh, and not get totally swept up in all the excitement that we have. Um, and so we also got to make the case, I think, for open data and open access. And it is really about, um, it's not enough just for sort of uh, the sort of 5% to be really excited about it uh, if they can't communicate that excitement and the rationale uh, for uh, wanting to exploit the benefits and show the benefits to researchers of living in a digital world, which I think is a point that you know, uh, many people share. So if you want to reach a community and want to talk to them, I think you've got to try and put yourself in their shoes. And uh, if you're thinking about you know, making an impact in the digital world, then uh, from academic perspective, you've got to think about, well, why is it that they got into research in the first place? And uh, I think these main reasons, uh, three sort of uh, summaries, uh, probably capture it for most researchers. There may be other reasons as well. We, you know, we want to understand the world. We're curious people as researchers. Uh, many of us want to change the world in some way. You know, we like to think that our research will uh, change the world, although actually that's not as important as wanting to understand the world, even though, of course, every grant application that's ever been submitted will tell you about the, the ultimate therapeutic benefit, et cetera, et cetera, uh, of the little piece of biology that they're planning to do. And we all have dreams of immortality, uh, even though we know we are allotted just a finite span. And in that digital world, then, of course, uh, those uh, motivations still play out and still have a very powerful pull. And I think it's that clash of cultures, as it were. The, the digital world is pulling us to be open, to be sharing data, you know, wants to be free, um, and all that jazz. But you've got to think about, you know, how does that connect with what researchers want to do with their time? Uh, and they are generally um, busy people. There are one or two uh, lazy individuals in the world of research, but most of the people I know tend to work uh, very long hours uh, and, and very hard. So we do have a thing called the internet now. Of course, the world is much more digitized, much more connected, and that's a great thing, and it's changing the way that we do things. Every particle of human activity, almost, it seems, can be measured and counted and recorded, and uh, this is GCHQ. Uh, which I think is one of the best exemplars of the way that the digital technologies have transformed the way that uh, our society uh, is run. 
so they are perhaps even, you know, hello guys at GCHQ, uh, monitoring the feed from this uh, uh, presentation as well, in case, uh, uh, in case something says something uh, questionable. Now, that capacity to measure activity and count things is very useful in very many uh, areas of human activity. And if you're running a business, if you're a car manufacturer or whatever, uh, running a production line, then you want to know, you know, how much am I paying for the raw materials that I'm using? How many vehicles am I producing a month? What's the productivity per worker? If you're wanting to manage a successful business where the bottom line is, am I making any money? Then having a good grasp of all the numbers is a very important part um, of your job and of doing it well. Even in the public sector, if you're running a hospital, you're not out to make a profit, not just yet. They haven't managed to privatize the whole thing just yet. Give them another five years. Uh, it's still important to be demonstrating you get value for money. You want high bed occupancy. You want to make sure that your uh, doctors are uh, having good outcomes on the various uh, treatments that they're giving. And so uh, the data and the information and the counting and the measurement that goes into monitoring that activity is tremendously useful. So there are, there are um, uh, tremendous benefits to be had from a culture which, in which everything is computerized, everything is digitized, and it makes it easy for us uh, to pull in numbers that capture and characterize the activities that we're interested in. But I think what's difficult, and this has obviously been on the rise for decades now, people were doing this even before computers, we're just getting better and better at it, and it's easier and easier um, to capture more elements. But there is a seductive nature to the whole process of counting and measuring that I think we need to be wary of. We need to think about where are the boundaries between where this is a good activity and where perhaps it's not actually uh, in so entirely legitimate. And so one of the course, the famous, okay, we can talk about impact factors, but this is another uh, element of this is the Times Higher uh, University uh, rankings, um, and which will tell you that the Caltech has a score of 94.9, <laughs> uh, whereas Harvard only manages to scrape together a score of 93.9. Now, hands up in this room, who understands what the difference between those two numbers means? <laughs> okay, you're all remarkably honest. So, but this is a measurement of human activity, of productivity in a way, the quality of a university, whatever that means. Now, the Times Higher does provide pages and pages of explanations of how they bring those numbers together, and it's basically an arbitrary aggregate of about five or six different things um, that they measure, but they're often using proxies, uh, they're often filling in data that isn't actually there. They're rescaling things in order to get uh, the, the sort of differentiation between the numbers. And so it's a very difficult process, I think, to justify. I would imagine that everyone who works at a university thinks that, well, actually, they do do lots of different things. And if you're going to assess the quality, well, you've really got to start thinking about, well, quality of what? You know, quality of research, quality of teaching, quality of life for the staff, quality of life for the students. What is it that you're measuring? What's important to you? And for all these different universities, uh, then there may be that actually they have different missions in life. You know, the mission of uh, Harvard may be different from the mission of you. Well, probably not, but if you work your way down the, the list, then more regionally based universities, perhaps they have a much more focus on serving their local communities than being a sort of international uh, global player. But they're all judged by the same measure. And we all believe that it's a measure. We call it rankings. You know, we're used to the idea of league tables from sports events where it seems entirely reasonable, okay? It's a fairly well-defined human activity. You know, if you score more goals, then you're probably better. Uh, nobody really takes much. I don't hear uh, angry debates within the, uh, the, the sort of English Premier League or the Scottish Premier League about the measurement system that is being used to judge different teams. <laughs> but somehow there are debates about it in here. And so that we do have to be aware of this, the seductive power uh, of numbers. And unfortunately, I think we have ended up getting to a situation where you know, we find ourselves in a film like this. You know, we think that we know what we're doing, okay? We know what we're measuring, um, and, uh, but we ended up in a kind of hell. And let me tell you, hell, one definition of hell is watching this film. <laughs> it is awful, okay? Actually, it was my daughter, Charlie, who picked it out. <laughs> uh, whatever, I still haven't forgiven her for it. But you know, what happens when the numbers run out? Okay, spoiler alert, the earth is destroyed. Okay, uh, uh, but actually, we've got in a world where you know, what happens when the numbers take over? And I think we're in a sort of dangerous cusp there where we have, in the university sector, allowed that to happen in the academic sector through the rise of the impact factors, through the rise of league tables. And it has evolved kind of naturally without anybody intending for this to happen. Nobody meant for it to happen, but we have got sucked into a culture where 
uh, we do reify the numbers, we do worry about impact factors, and that's because they do matter for people's careers. People aren't being silly here, but we are trapped in a scheme uh, of our own devising uh, that's actually um, not doing us any good. So I would uh, recommend to you uh, uh, the Leiden Manifesto, which appeared in Nature relatively recently, which was produced by a bunch of very talented bioinformaticians, and it's about a set of rules for uh, the use and to help avoid the misuse um, of uh, bibliometric and other types of indicator uh, that one might use to characterize different aspects of academic uh, and research activity. Uh, also coming soon is the metric tide, which is the HESI uh, review on the use of metrics, possibility of the use of metrics for the future F. I'm not going to talk about it uh, in any detail. I was on the committee along with Ian Viney, who's talking uh, after Martin. I don't know if Ian's going to say much about the review himself. No, he's not. Okay, but on 9th of July, uh, there's a, it's 170 plus pages, uh, but fortunately there is an executive summary and there are uh, recommendations at the end. And it will take a critical look at it and we are hoping that it will um, sort of uh, be an important document, an important sort of line in the sand as it were. Uh, we're not recommending going over to an all metrics based ref, okay? Uh, and we recognize, of course, that you know, metrics are here and they're here to stay. And uh, the, the, the sort of motif really is going to be that we've got to really think about them responsibly. And that's incumbent on all participants in this endeavor, us as academics, bibliometricians, uh, university managers, uh, publishers, everybody who has a stake in this, um, there are responsibilities um, that go with that. Because we've got to recognize that the numbers um, are really not telling us the whole story. So it was, I don't remember who it was that said this morning, you said, you know, you, it's all right to count the numbers, but you need a human to interpret them. Was it you, Ewan? Yeah, so, so very well said. So if we want to sort of think about how we shift that culture, and I don't, you know, another spoiler alert, I don't have an answer at the end of my talk, I'm afraid. But I do think it's a conversation we got to start having, not just among ourselves, mm -hmm. Uh, but of course also with the, uh, the wider academic community, and it is going to be uh, a major undertaking. But if we think about, you know, and just think about the research aspect of what people do, you know, what is it that we think about, uh, how would we define um, good research? You know, so these are the things that I came up with, and it's all about you know, transforming something, transforming understanding of the natural world, so you think about the structure of DNA, discovery of RNA interference, uh, the Higgs boson, the theory, and then the discovery 50 years later. Uh, physicists are very slow at things, apparently. Uh, transformative methods, the invention of X-ray crystallography, polymerase chain reaction, most recently CRISPR, which is going to allow us to edit our genomes until we probably kill ourselves. Uh, but let's see what happens. Transformative technology, silicon chip, graphene. Okay, the jury's still out on graphene, but there's not a lot of money going into it, so probably some good things will come. I think there's a light bulb, isn't there? There's a graphene light bulb that's come out, so that's good. And then transformative impact, which is something that has come through the REF agenda. And I think although a lot of people in many different forums had, uh, were suspicious of it, I think actually in the, in the, in the implementation, in the practice, the way that it's come out, it was implemented rather pragmatically, I think, by HESI. And uh, I think a lot of universities uh, and researchers have been uh, pleasantly surprised by the, the good and interesting things that have come out of it. They've discovered things about their research that they didn't know. And I think many of them discovered that actually they are changing the world in ways that they didn't even realize before. So those, you know, those are all good things. So I think you know, we can probably have a debate about maybe add or subtract uh, little bits and pieces to that. But there's a general um, consensus about what is good research. So, but how do we measure good research? And this is what we do at the minute. Uh, we publish it in a high impact factor journal uh, or we count the citations, okay? So it boils down to that simplicity. Okay, at the bottom, yes, okay, occasionally there is some sort of expert evaluation. I know there's peer review and whatnot, but you know, let's just think about um, uh, uh, what's the reality. I mean, I was thinking a, a couple of weeks ago I in our section, there was a small group, uh, they uh, sort of going past the photocopier and they were all sort of drinking champagne and, and celebrating and whatnot. And I said, oh, what's the occasion? I thought it was a PhD virus or something. And they said, oh, we got a paper published in this journal. I won't mention the name, okay? And uh, that tells you, that's very telling about the culture. It wasn't, uh, we did a fantastic piece of science and we got it published. We published in this journal. Okay, and that tells you that's exactly what matters to people. And, and it does matter because it matters to their careers, it matters to promotion, to jobs, and to uh, grant income in the future. And we have to um, extract ourselves uh, uh, from that. And it's going, to be, it's going to be difficult. And it's going to be difficult because that, um, the, the sort of fixation with the impact factor, of course, then lends tremendous 
uh, advantage to the traditional publishing method, which is relatively closed, still mostly behind paywalls. One might argue that uh, you know, having top tier premier journals is a good thing in the world of research because it spurs people to do their very best research. They compete for the prizes and the prizes to get into a high impact factor journal. And that's one of the benefits that comes off it. I could think of a number of downsides. So there's a high bar to entry, but of course that's a slightly artificial bar. It's set by the number of pages uh, printed uh, in the paper uh, version of the journal. It slows publication because people aim high and then get rejected and then work their way down the uh, list. So how many months or years does it take to get published? And that is, um, and that's a reduction in researcher productivity uh, right there. Uh, so that's not necessarily a good thing in terms of value for money. Peer review uh, has its problems, traditionally relatively closed, although that's changing now, relatively conservative. So the graphene paper famously, infamously uh, rejected by Nature twice. Um, uh, but even so then actually they will uh, publish eye-catching research, okay? Uh, so uh, Arsenic Life, published by Science, piece of dreadful tosh. Uh, I would like to see the reviewers' comments on that, but it was a sexy topic, and uh, I think that was what won over the editor, maybe not the uh, reviewers. Uh, the impact factor uh, uh, reward system fosters cheating. We know that retraction rates um, correlate highly with impact factor, and that is just people playing the system, and that is, you know, that's human behavior. We're a flawed creation. Uh, we've got to live with it, but we've got to think about ways of uh, mitigating those worst effects. And I think uh, changing the publication system is one way to do that. You know, it, it, cheating is, it's increasing, I think, in the, in the public domain in terms of people uh, hearing about it. There was articles in the New York Times recently about, you know, the problems with science and focusing on retractions of, you know, papers in high-profile journals where the researchers have spent public money and, uh, and basically made up the results. So science recently had a a paper on um, uh, a sort of psychology paper on surveys that uh, the, the ability of surveys to change people's minds it was attracted because the data were uh, made up and there was no ethical approval and that ultimately may come home to roost you know uh, we the, the UK uh, research budget isn't going northwards anytime soon I fear unfortunately at the minute we enjoy quite a high level of public trust but we will squander that uh, if we don't uh, get our house in order paywall publishing of course restricts access and is uh, these days a poor fit um, to public policy. And even you know, the coalition government got it, and Janet Finch's uh, quotation, uh, however many flaws there might be in the report, but the principle that the results of research that's been publicly funded should be freely accessible in the public domain is fundamentally unanswerable. And actually, there's no good reason that publicly funded research should not be open access on, on publication straight away. Uh, it should just become an inalterable uh, principle. So if we reimagine what we would like to have, let's say we can sort of, we can't do this, but let's say we sweep away the existing system and like start with a blank sheet of paper and start again, what would we like, okay? I have a few ideas, we can talk about them hopefully at this uh, time of discussion. But, uh, and I also want to reflect actually some of the thoughts that occurred to me when I attended this meeting at the Royal Society back in April and May, which was very interesting. Uh, talked for four days, talked about the future of uh, scholarly communication, lots of different uh, aspects, publishing models, problems with peer review, problems of reproducibility, publishing data, many of the topics that have sort of been aired, aired today. And one of the interesting things that came out of it was the uh, level of support in the room, and it was a sort of FRSs, interested people, publishers, uh, sort of senior academics, uh, funding agencies, uh, and Randy Sheckman. Steve Wozniak uh, was not there. Uh, the, was the idea of, of preprints, so b borrowing the idea from the physics and maths community, which have sort of lived with this and were quite comfortable with it for uh, quite some time. And that gets you straight to the problem, uh, through the problem of rapid dissemination, okay? Or it, it solves the problem of, of the retardation of publishing that the existing system uh, engenders. So you just get it out there, and actually, uh, preprints tend to attract many more constructive comments and criticism from the community. And that was seemed to be because people feel that actually if they make comments at that stage, then they can help change and improve the paper and there's a contribution there that they are uh, helping. Okay, three minutes, fine, oh, that will be enough. Uh, commenter credit for that in some shape or form uh, would help to uh, foster that activity. We should have just open access journals. I would say open plus style peer review. So is it original and is it done to a decent level of competence and not really in the post-publication peer review uh, vanguard with Michael Eisen, but uh, we can talk about that. I would also uh, permit confirmatory studies. Reproducibility is important and negative results also important, 
but simply uh, very rarely appear under the current system. Again, a system of reviewer credit uh, you know, linked to ORCIDs perhaps to make it easier to manage so that uh, this important academic activity is recognized. It's all about getting the incentives right. Competition on service and price so that we start to bring down the costs of publishing, which are, uh, as everybody knows, getting out of control. And of course, it gives you universal access. And with more readers, you get more scrutiny. So even though you have sort of a quick sort of flight check, as it were, uh, review, then if you've got a broad audience reading it, then you're much more likely to pick up um, any errors that get through the system, as they inevitably will. And you've got accessible data, and I've added software now. That's something we had a talk from GitHub this morning, just to make sure I'm totally on the zeitgeist. You can, you know, it's reused and reanalyzed, and it's a disincentive to fraud, uh, because if you have to put out the real data, then you know that people are going to check it. And so uh, it would hopefully encourage better behavior. Now, it's not all um, jam. Uh, there are downsizes, potentially. There are certainly quality concerns. And you will hear these in the academic community, OK? The vanity publishing model of open access, you know, pay to publish. Uh, but I, do, I think those are often overstated, but we have to sort of address them sensibly. I, I think they're mitigated by openness, because if you publish, it's out there, and the whole world is scrutinizing it. And I think it's actually exemplified, you know, Bahannon and Beale have basically sort of tarnished themselves because their own relatively shoddy work in some aspects uh, has been sort of exposed by um, uh, wide open scrutiny. Delegation of quality control to the reader, if you don't have sort of very severe uh, peer review at the, at the beginning, mistakes may only be detected after publication, and that's a concern, I think, particularly in medical research, particularly if it's to do with clinical practice, then you want, you know, journals might be very nervous about publishing something that turns out to be wrong, uh, if people die as a result, you know, and that is something that genuinely uh, may happen. I'm not a medical researcher myself, but that is an issue within the community. Really big question, how do we get the incentives right, okay? At the minute, I think it's widely recognized that they are wrong, and it's going to be an enormous, enormous uh, amount of work uh, to, to swing it around. I think we have to figure out post-publication reward mechanisms that are journal independent, okay? Uh, and evaluate the academics on what they do, you know, not where they publish, and evaluate them just on more than just the research output um, um, and see the uh, declaration of research assessment for more details. Questions, do we need selective journals to foster high quality research? Again, I'd like to hear a discussion about that. I don't think we do. I think, you know, uh, academics are competitive enough amongst themselves, ambitious, want to do really good eye-catching work, and I don't think we need um, uh, particular journals to do it. And last line, uh, do we need journals to foster disciplines and subdisciplines? This is an, uh, an area, obviously, of concern for learning societies where open access presents uh, particular challenges. And again, I think we need to be sympathetic to those, but I think the bottom line is that we do want um, open access um, straight away. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. We are having a panel at the end. That's a great talk. I was just thinking while you were talking, just what, what do you think? I think one of the reasons why academic, like myself, and I'm, I'm not, not, not a medical researcher, so um, we, one of the reasons why we want to get our publications in high impact journals is because that makes your study um, um, be highlighted from the noise. So. When I was talking to you and, and with the system, there's an, there's an enormous amount of studies out there that could be published that way. So what's going to be what's going to be the new way of making your study trendy? Because I don't think necessarily that's what nature says is the correct parameters of what should be trendy or not. That's obviously we can discuss it. But what what would be what would be the new way? Like again, the discussion we ha we were having this morning, like. Which one is going to be more tweeted or like more, you know? Uh, th that's an interesting question. I think if you delegate that to journals, you just run straight back to the impact factor problem. And that's, that's, that's one of the difficulties that we, we want to get away with. I had hoped that, you know, sort of social media tools would help with that to sort of, uh, I think, enlarge an activity that we're all used to, those of us academics who go to conferences. You know, you go to a conference and you hear somebody's talk. And if it's pre-publication work, 
you know, you are an expert in that area or you know the area and you can immediately say that was a fantastic talk or not a really good talk and people will be talking about it in the, in the coffee breaks and the, the, the word will spread. So in your area, you know, there are communities where one, you know, uh, if the group comes together, they can validate um, the work. And so, you know, I had hopes that, you know, uh, uh, so organizations like Mendeley would do that sort of thing because they can build communities and user groups where they have sort of interest groups on the, on the internet, like a, a group around a coffee table at a conference, and they would talk about, say, oh, I saw this paper at the ASP the other week, you know, have you seen it? They've got a really nice experiment. And, and that's the way that you sort of build that, that, that uh, validation, as it were. I mean, there are more formal mechanisms that you can do it. Mendeley's time with Elsevier gives me lots of problems uh, with that, and I don't think they have taken off as a universal platform because of that, necessarily. And um, I'd like to see a real open source, open community uh, version of that um, coming out. You mentioned um, each of the kind of four criteria for good research, and uh, one of the things is that if the three of the four were actually quite easy to keep where the science is just in the STEM field, but would be actually kind of difficult to, to show um, the or like the arts or the social sciences. Uh, sorry, I just have visualization in my head that the first three would definitely would have like all your examples were art sciences, and it's basically like okay, well. No, no, absolutely not. I mean, uh, and obviously, the many humanities um, units of assessment were in the REF, and there were many uh, case studies from there uh, which were, you know, very useful and valuable. I, I can't quote one off the top of my head, but, uh, you know, my top one was I want to understand the world. Well, uh, for me as a, as a uh, sort of structural village, I'm interested in the natural world, but, you know, historians are interested <coughs> in the human world, and I imagine people get into history because they're really curious about what used to happen uh, in the past. And so, you know, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be so down on the humanity. I think a lot of the, uh, the, the those criteria would uh, would match them, and and a developing understanding of what really happened in history actually helps us to develop legislation today. Helps us to sort of change the world that we do it today. You know, I mean, uh, the ab abolition of slavery, I think, was based on a sort of historical understanding, uh, uh, for example. So I think there are many ways. I mean, I, yeah, okay, my examples were all, um, you know, uh, life sciences. That's, that's where I work, okay? But uh, please, please, please feel free to add to them. Bring in one more. Perfect. Okay, thank you.